Okay, hi guys, this is the second part of our manufacturing processes. So what we're gonna be talking about are shaping uh, techniques and some other techniques for um, manufacturing products. So um, this is a definition from the IB's glossary of terms, so make sure you know it, shaping techniques. Um, and basically it's a manufacturing method for modifying the shape of a material, right? So essentially it's, what we're gonna look at is things like molding and casting. Um, those are types of shaping techniques, but this is an example of injection molding. So they're using a plastic and they're using something called injection molding to get this form right here. So it's shaping rather than uh, milling or turning or uh, 3D printing or something like that. Okay, so let's move on. Our first shaping technique is molding and essentially molding is heating a material until it's a liquid or it's in a pliable state. So something that is pliable means that it's sort of moldable like uh, plasticine or clay or play-doh. Those are all examples of moldable um, materials. Okay, so you're either heating it until it's a liquid or it's pliable and then you're going to place that uh, material into a mold and then you'll do something with it in the mold to make the shape that you, you desire. Um, you can use plastics and polymers, so polymers are basically uh, something like a plastic, um, but you can also use glass or metal. Here we go, injection molding is our first type of molding, and what we're doing with injection molding is we're injecting plastic into a mold. And so please watch this video, it shows it, but you can kind of see the process just from here. You know, here's the plastic right here, it's this red stuff. And here is something that is called a die. And this is a cross section of the die. So you gotta imagine that it's been cut in half. So um, this is a cross section of the die. And you would inject or squeeze um, plastic into this mold and it's gonna fill the empty spaces within the mold so that you have your product. Okay, and so this is called injection molding. Um, you don't have a lot of waste because, you know, like for instance, this little red part right here is probably something that would be cut off because it's it's part of the injection process. Um, you can put that back into the hopper where the plastic is, remelt it, and, and inject it into the next piece. So it, it actually has uh, very little waste involved. It um, You can use uh, thermoplastics for this. So these are plastics that you can melt over and over again. This is a bit like the plastics that we use in our 3D printers. And essentially, many, many, many of the products that you will have in your house have been injection molded. So anything that's made out of plastic, not anything, but many, and I'd say probably most of the things that you have in your house that are made out of plastic were made with injection molding. Um, okay, so things like a comb or anything that's plastic and mass produced, garbage bins, tubs, you name it, those things are done with injection molding. All right, let's talk about our next uh, type of molding, and this is also very common because you know anytime you have a uh, water bottle, a plastic water bottle, it's been made with this process right here. And this is called blow molding. So in the blow molding process, what you're doing is you are inflating. So you're blowing hot air into um, thermoplastics, and it's gonna basically fill the space inside the mold, and it's gonna make some sort of container. So that's what we're looking at is bottles and hollow containers. Um, it can, it doesn't have a lot of waste because again, like this piece right here would actually be waste. I think actually all the way up to here, right at the edge of this rim right here, this is all waste, but you can cut that off and then put it back into the, um, materials for, um, and it can be used again. So there's not a lot of waste. Um, you can use this with thermoplastics and glass, but essentially watch this video. It'll give you a good idea of how blow molding works. So, um, have a quick look at that video. Okay, we have rotational molding. So rotational molding, similar idea. Um, you have a, a mold, and in, case, in this case, this is the mold. It's a very large mold, and this is making like a big plastic water container, so a big plastic water uh, storage container. This is actually the mold for it, and it's made out of metal, and you would put it inside this thing, which is the rotation chamber, so this thing's gonna rotate this big mold, and you throw all the plastic inside here, and you rotate it, and as you rotate it, it's going to melt the plastic, so it's heated, uh, it's gonna be rotated, and then that's what's gonna make the actual product. Um, these are thermoplastics, and you know, lots of big things are made this way. So like, for instance, this water tank, um, but also buoys. These are things that you see in the ocean that mark 
um, channels and things like that in the in the ocean. Uh, pontoons for boats. So if you have a plastic pontoon on a boat, it would probably be made this way. And then something that's like a large toy. Um, we used to have this sort of like plastic house uh, that my kids used to play with, play in when they were young, and that would have been made with uh, rotational molding. Okay, this is something called compression molding, and so in this case, you can think of it as something that's being pressed. So materials are also heated until they're pliable. It's placed on a mold, so this is the bottom half of the mold, and then the top half of the mold will come down. It'll squish and press all of this material into um, where it belongs. And you see this a lot when you are making things that are composites. So we're looking at composite materials. So this could be, for instance, you know, maybe a resin or plastic that has uh, fiberglass in it, for instance. So like a sink or a tub it would be made in this, in this way. Okay, so um, we would use special thermoplastics for that. But you could also maybe use things like ceramics. So if you had a large pot, it could be made this way. Okay, uh, we have thermal forming. So thermal forming, um, one of the ways to do this is something called vacuum forming, and this is basically the way that most thermal forming, forming happens. And you have a plastic sheet that you heat until it's pliable, and then you place it on a mold. And in this case, this is a male mold. Uh, the female mold would be like just the opposite of this. It'd be like the inside if, uh, of, you know, kind of think of what the opposite of this would look like. Um, and what you do is you, you heat that up and then you vacuum. So these tubes right here um, are attached to a vacuum, so it's going to suck out all the air inside, and then this plastic piece will form around the mold. So have a watch of this uh, video. It shows you a really good idea of this. Um, you do have to be careful with this because you have to think of something called release. So in the idea of release, it basically means like you have to be able to pull this off of the mold. So notice how this steps inwards on the male mold. That's so that you can release the plastic from the mold. If this was like the female mold where it would step inwards like this, it wouldn't work. So if you imagine if you had a male mold where it would step in like this on both sides, what would end up happening is that the plastic over here would prevent you from pulling this off of the mold because you have like a you know, a diagonal sort of um, strip right here. So you couldn't pull it off of the mold. So there's something to definitely think about with thermal forming is that you have to have the correct kind of release on it. Um, some things that, that you would see doing this would be disposable cups, eggs, egg cartons, trays, the refrigerator liner in your refrigerator is probably made this way, so lots of stuff is made this way. Um, some definite advantages of molding is it's fast. You can really produce things quite fast. Injection molding and those kinds of things are quite fast, and you can see that in the, in the video. Uh, you might have some uh, flexibility with materials and color, like an injection molder doesn't care that the plastic is red or green or whatever, so you do have some color flexibility. There's not a lot of waste because you know the parts that you've cut off can go back into the process. There is some design flexibility. Um, there is, however, a disadvantage of the high cost, right? So it's expensive to buy the actual um, machines and then like for instance the dyes the molds are very expensive to produce also so that's a, an issue with those um, generally what you would do is mill the mold so you would use a milling machine to make the mold and then um, that's an expensive process because of labor and uh, you know uh, uh, materials and things like that so the it's, it's got a high capital cost but part, parts and sides are also, there's restrictions. And, you know, we talked about this with the thermal set molding, so that you, uh, sorry, thermal forming, uh, where you have to make sure that you pay attention to the release on those things. So that can be a, an issue is the parts and size. Okay, next um, type of uh, shaping technique we're going to talk about is something called casting. So when we're casting something, we're pouring molten material, and it, usually we mean metal. But it also could be something like chocolate, like when you eat a, you know, a chocolate that's formed in the shape of, I don't know, like a, I don't know, like a starfish or something like that. You know, it's it's going to be made with this. It's casting it. You're casting in chocolate. Just, but most often when we talk about casting, we're talking about metal. So it's poured into a mold. The mold is often broken, and then what's left is something called a casting. Again, materials usually metal. 
And things like sculptures and parts of cars like the engine and something like a propeller on a big ship or even a small ship is probably made by a casting. Okay, so here's some uh, videos to show you how casting works. This is um, casting in iron. So this is cast iron. Um, and this is actually an old technique. This is using sand. And you'll see how they do this. They basically push um, wood into, the, into sand and then they pour molten iron into that. And that's, that's giving us our cast iron. Uh, this is bronze, and so like this is a sculpture, so go ahead and watch this video, and you'll get a good idea of how they made this sculpture. Do pay attention to the fact that they're using many different steps in order to make the mold. They're sculpting the, the first thing out of clay, then they're making a silicon mold on top of that clay, filling that with um, plastic, uh, sorry, not plastic, um, with wax, and then they're heating the wax to, uh, sorry, then they're putting um, clay around the wax, then they're melting the wax out and pouring the bronze into that. So do watch this. It's kind of an interesting video on, on how um, bronze casting works. So we have some advantages and disadvantages of casting. So some advantages is you can make some really complex shapes like that face. Um, it can be cost effective and you can be flexible in size. You can make really big castings. Um, the finishing is usually required, so that means that usually you're not getting a, a complete product. And again, if you look at what happened with that bronze sculpture, there was a lot of finishing that had to happen um, after, it was, uh, after it came out of its mold. And it can be quite labor-intensive. Okay, uh, another shaping technique, which we've already covered, is knitting and weaving. So if you want to review that, go back to slides uh, 76 and 77 in the slideshow. Okay. We're talking about joining techniques now. So joining techniques are a method that is used to join two similar or dissimilar materials together. And there's two types. There's permanent and temporary. And notice that this says cannot be easily undone. It doesn't mean that it can't be undone once you've joined something together. It just means that it's not as easy. Whereas temporary, we're looking at something that can be easily undone. Uh, one of the first permanent ones that we want you to learn is adhering or glue. And in this, you're using an adhesive. So you're putting adhesive on one part, and then you're adding a second part to that and to glue them together. And once the adhesive cures, and this is an important word, you should be using cures and not dries. Okay? Glues don't dry, they cure. We say dry, but it's better to use the word cure. Okay? Um, so once they've cured, you have you know, one body coming out of that one object. Uh, another permanent um, uh, form is um, fusing. Okay, so this is joining technique, and so we're fusing. This is welding or brazing, and in that you are essentially melting. Usually, two materials made out of the same thing. You're melting them at high temperature together uh, to join them together. Um, you can also do this by soldering. Okay, so that can be dissimilar materials that you can solder together. Um, design contexts include, uh, you know, when they make like a steel frame of, of a big building or a ship or something like that, they are usually using welding. Plumbing is also wel welded together, and electronic connections in, in devices are usually um, welded together, and that would be a form of fusing, and it's a permanent um, joining technique. All right. Fasteners can also be permanent. So one of the fasteners that are permanent are nails. So these are nails. Generally, you understand that if you if you put a nail in something, it's not easy to remove. So it's generally considered a permanent fastener, a permanent joining technique, because it's not easy to remove the nails. And then you also have something like rivets. So these are rivets right here. If you want to see how they get put together, please watch this video and they'll show you how um, rivets work. And we actually have one of these hand riveters at school. All right, design contexts uh, include, you know, com combining um, different artifacts together using um, dissimilar materials. Also, like for instance, your lockers at school, the doors are attached to the hinge hinges with things like these pop rivets. Okay, so let's talk about temporary. And one of the temporary ones, um, is fasteners and I know we had fasteners in the permanent ones but these are temporary fasteners and so these are things that um, are things like nuts and bolts and screws or pins 
uh, rings, Velcro, that kind of stuff can all be considered a temporary fastener. Okay. Um, an example of this would be like flat pack furniture. If you think of like Ikea furniture that you have to put together, it comes packed flat for you. And then you, you take it out of the box and you put it together to make, you know, I don't know, a shelf or a, a desk or something like that. Um, but you can also unpack those. So you can, you can take them apart and put them back in their flat, flattened form. Um, you can also have temporary adhesives. So if you think of something like this, um, this is a command strip um, hook, and basically it allows you to put a hook on the wall and not damage the wall. And you can take this off again. These little tabs, you can pull on them and they, it pops off of the wall. It's a bit like a post-it note, to tell you the truth. So that would be a temporary adhe uh, uh, adhesive. Also hot glue guns can, are a type of temporary adhesives because you can easily take them apart. Um, so that's an example of a joining technique that is temporary and using an adhesive. All right, thanks for watching.